Good afternoon, early evening, everyone. I hope you're all still awake Thanks and enjoying We Share Fest this year. So what I'm going to talk about today, and this is great because my entire PowerPoint presentation looks like it's messed up, but bear with me, um, is a systems thinking approach to urban resilience and how to create urban resilience. It's a bit of a personal story that I'm going to tell you guys, because it's not just about um, this sort of abstract concept of systems thinking. It's more about how I started to realize that um, if you look at you know, a colony of ants, where there's millions of individuals all going about their daily activities, their programming, and they're just responding to chemical signals, it creates this really crazy meta-level effect of a colony, of all the structures that they build, etc. And we are all like these individual ants. All of our activities result in meta-level effects, like the performance and functioning of the economy. And if you want to change that system, you actually have to understand the rules of systems thinking and why systems function the way they do. So my entire career has really been uh, about this kind of search for understanding how you can create large-scale change very quickly. Um, now I actually need my slides. So first, really briefly, I'm going to tell you about my company, Metabolic. Then I'm going to talk about the motivation and urgency that brought me to starting the company and uh, introduce the concept of urban resilience from a systems approach and give you guys some examples of our work in Amsterdam that have exemplified this systems thinking approach to urban resilience. So about my company, we are a consulting and uh, venture building firm based in Amsterdam. It's uh, five years old now. We have an interdisciplinary team of around 25 people based in both Amsterdam and Aruba. We do a lot of advisory work where we analyze systems and develop these kinds of graphs showing uh, how resources flow through our economy, et cetera, to understand what's going on and where the leverage points are for change. We also do our own R&D and tech development. So this is a, the solar transformer, a, a solar-powered, um, basically, generator that can generate a smart grid anywhere. And we do a lot of activation work, so communicating the results of our findings to try to get others to adopt them and become entrepreneurs on their own. And this is our center metabolic lab, which is uh, at a site in Amsterdam that I'll tell you guys more about later. And so for the last five years, one of the big lenses through which we've been active is the framework of the circular economy, which I'm not going to talk about so much today, but if you guys are interested in it, hit us up. So getting to the personal story that I mentioned. When I was 13, I was um, working in New York City in a biology lab um, at New York Hospital. I was going to be a molecular geneticist. This was the plan from very early on. And I spent a lot of time looking at flasks of growth medium for bacteria, which looked kind of like that picture on the left. So in the beginning, there, it would look like nothing was going on in the flask. It was all clear. And as the bacteria started to multiply, it would get cloudier and cloudier. And it's this kind of exponential growth curve that the bacteria follow. So actually, in the last five, 10 minutes of the growth cycle, the flask would go from being half full to full to very rapidly dead. So you had to really carefully calculate how many cells you had put in there to make sure that you weren't going to lose your entire flask. And this was kind of normal uh, experience for me. Um, so I was really shocked when I went to college and I was taking an entirely unrelated class to uh, biology, and I ran into these graphs. So all of these are exponential growth curves, hockey stick patterns, that are basically the same as those bacteria in that flask. And I became really concerned because this is not about a flask of bacteria, this is about the Earth and the key parameters that keep us alive on it. So everything from resource use, like paper, water, et cetera, to loss of global biodiversity is accelerating in these rapid exponential growth curves. And so one of the first things I wanted to know is, OK, so where is the tipping point? Are we actually at the beginning of this exponential growth curve, or are we close to the end? Um, and for that reason, it's very useful to consider this framework that came out in 2009 from the Stockholm Resilience Center called the Planetary Boundaries. So scientists from around the world came together to define these nine key boundary areas or key Earth systems that need to be kept functioning properly in order to keep humans alive on the planet. And you see um, that at climate change, we talk about it a lot, 
but actually biospheric integrity or biodiversity is the one that is most transgressed. The WWF estimates that in the last 40 years, we've lost 40% of uh, global biodiversity. So this is um, a, a really key issue we have very little time to address. Um, so actually, you can start to see that this is really a systems problem. It's not just one sustainability challenge that we have to look at. It's all of these things interacting. It's like solving a Rubik's Cube. So how do you actually uh, begin to solve the, this complex issue of all of these interacting problems? There are lots of positive frameworks that um, do provide answers. And um, one of the things is the circular economy, as I mentioned. And to understand what is exactly non-circular about our current economy, we did this analysis of all the material flows on the planet, so basically every resource that's getting extracted everywhere, to see where they're going, and how these things are actually connected to the different planetary boundaries that we're transgressing. And so, for example, the top line there is biomass, and 20% of the materials that we're extracting per year are consi consist of biomass. But that single flow is much more connected to all of the planetary boundaries that we're transgressing. So this starts to give you a sense of how we need to prioritize where we're putting our efforts in changing the way our economy functions and which resource flows we're actually trying to shift most rapidly. Based on this analysis, we came up with a prioritization for where we really need to focus. And the top two things are agriculture, followed by cities and the built environment. Cities in particular, which is what we're talking about today, are a really interesting leverage point. They only occupy around 3% of the planet's surface, so it's a really relatively small area, but they produce 80% of GDP, they're responsible for 90% of innovation, and they produce 50% of waste and consume 75% of resources. So in this very small area of the planet, um, you're concentrating all of these different resource flows. And if you can just figure out how to change the way that cities function, you can have a huge positive impact on all of those exponential growth curves that I showed, and also on the livelihoods of people, more than half of whom, of course, as we know, live in cities today. So urban resilience is um, a term that's been rightly popularized in the last 10 years or so. Um, and the Rockefeller Foundation, which is very active in this field, defines it as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, etc., to adapt and respond to shocks. There's lots of um, uh, alternate definitions here. There's a lot of buzz in the literature, but this is a pretty decent one to understand what's meant here. And there's a lot of um, different values that are pulled out from, uh, that are discussed as, as resulting from taking a resilience approach to cities and development. Um, and as I've been talking about this, um, I, I've discussed the issue of systems thinking, and resilience is actually, if you look at it, a systems property. So to make a system resilient, you need to have it be redundant, you need to look at the structure of networks and relationships in that system, um, and you need to look at the speed of the connections between the individuals. So how do you actually take this approach of systems thinking, thinking about you know, being a single ant in a colony to change a system to actually build urban resilience? Um, very basic level, what is a system? It's just a set of interacting components that form an integrated whole. Uh, and like the human brain, for example, is made up of all sorts of individual neurons, but together it acts as a, as a whole unit, as the brain. And likewise with ant colonies and also with cities. And as I mentioned before with this Rubik's Cube example, the reason that thinking about this as a system is so important is that you don't want to create new problems. If you're trying to move one of those cubes into a different location, you um, want to make sure that you're not messing everything else up at the same time. So you actually need to be aware of all the different interactions and the rules of how they result in uh, a product. And one of the reasons that you know, uh, we want to do this, uh, especially in design and in urban planning, is because you have a lot of different unintended outcomes that happen when you don't think systemically. On the left, you have three uh, different types of light bulbs, and I'm just going to give this one example. Um, if you just look at incandescent bulbs, which are very high energy using, and you tell a designer, OK, solve this problem, make me a light source that's much less energy intensive, they might come up with the CFL bulb, which is on the left. But then that can create a whole new suite of problems, because CFL bulbs are actually mercury-containing and can result in a lot of 
unintended toxicity. If you break one in your home, you're releasing a neurotoxin, etc. And so unless you consider all these parameters, you're going to create new types of externalities. So this is one of the key reasons that we need to take this approach. Um, systems thinking is often not used because it's difficult. There's a lot of complexity. There are many different feedback loops and tipping points within systems. What's shown here is just a small portion of the human metabolism. So you have to kind of understand how to abstract from this. Um, so we have created our own sort of approach for boiling this down into an application that's usable. So we model the system in a basic, simple way. We look at the current state of how it's functioning. We try to understand the key interactions that are going on between the different elements in that system, and then try to strengthen uh, the outcomes that we want to have found. So uh, we go through this visioning process where we define how we want that system to change, and then do a lot of backcasting to get to where we need to go. One of the things that we uh, sometimes use for inspiration, for understanding how to change systems, is um, this framework that was brought up uh, by Donella Meadows, um, who was a quite famous system scientist. And so she described 12 leverage points, or 12 ways in which you can change a system to behave the way that you want it to, um, in or and ordered them in, strength, in order of uh, impact and strength. So most of the time, people focus way down at the bottom. And I'm sorry that this slide is quite messed up in its format, but the constants and parameters and numbers. So changing the size of a tax, for example, or uh, the cost of a product. But this actually doesn't change the structure of the system, the basic rules for why things are working. So um, if, even if you make fuel more expensive, because our roads are structured the way they are, people continue to drive because they absolutely have to. So it's only when you get to the deeper layers of the system when you start to actually create real change and build actually new models of resilience. And um, one of the, the higher up you go, basically on this, on this kind of ladder, the more effective the means of change are, but also sometimes the more difficult they are to enact. And one of the ones that we like focusing on, too, as an example, is changing the structure of information flows. So giving people access to data or information in a new way can actually change the way the system works by changing people's ability to understand how, how to structure that system and how to manipulate it. Um, and that's uh, one, one basic example of that um, that you guys probably all have experienced, is if you're taking a shower, um, and you are basically trying to uh, twist the, uh, the knob for um, changing the temperature of the water, and the water is really cold. Um, sometimes, if you have a really old boiler where it's in the basement, you, know, you twist it one way, and the water gets really hot suddenly, and you have to twist it back, and it's this kind of like dance. And that's because of a delay in informational feedback. So you are not getting information at the correct time, um, as, the, as the boiler I I is, so it's creating this weird loop. And if you smooth those informational feedback connections, you can actually make systems function a lot better. Um, another case of this with home energy monitoring, if you, if you just give someone information about how much energy they're using, they suddenly have a clearer understanding uh, of that, and we've seen that people, on average, use 50% less energy. Um, and of course, like globally, this is a huge topic with um, the open data revolution, as it's called. Um, and here's a poster from Open Data Africa. So now getting to the sort of more practical and applied side of this, um, we applied these principles of systems change for building resilience and looking at all these different leverage points to a real case study in a site in Amsterdam, which is called the Koval. We developed this project Three years ago, it was uh, officially opened, um, and uh, we did it with a lot of different partners. And this is the artist's visual visualization of the site um, before uh, we actually went into building it. So if you've ever been to Amsterdam, I'm going to see if I can find the laser pointer, but I don't know if I can here. So this is um, Amsterdam Central Station, and around a kilometer north is this plot of land uh, that used to be a shipyard. So it was a polluted plot of land around half a hectare. And we thought, because this whole part of the city is really transforming, 
that if you can create a new blueprint for urban development, for the way people interact and apply all these different systems principles, not only do you create resilience in this micro-model uh, part of the city, but you can also start to create a blueprint that can be copied more broadly in Amsterdam and in other cities. So, um, here are some key stats. Um, the uh, pl plot was polluted, like I said, because of all the boats that had been built and the uh, paint and oil that had gotten into the soil. Um, it's a 10-year land lease from the government, so it's temporary. That put a lot more extra pressure on the project to figure out how to make it work financially in a short amount of time. We had a very small budget to develop 17 buildings, around half a million euros. Um, and the, uh, the idea was that the municipality said, anyone who has a great idea for how to deal with this site, come to us with it. Um, it has to be super sustainable, and if we approve it, you get to build it. So with our consortium, which consisted of quite a few architecture firms, um, there was a pretty good idea that we proposed for how to do this in an effective way. The idea was to use all of these houseboats that are really common um, housing in, in the Netherlands, these floating structures, and actually retrofit them and put them on the land to uh, build the, the community. And that would reduce the cost of the construction, but also um, make the whole thing uh, more sustainable inherently because we're recycling whole buildings. We also did a lot of modeling, so to understand how all the different resource flows, information flows um, would work on the site, and we developed certain uh, frameworks for how you could decentralize a lot of the production of uh, resources, um, monitor a lot of the data, apply all of these various system principles. And this is actually what the outcome was, what we currently have in terms of resource cycling on the Goval. So we had a lot of different performance goals that we set, 100% renewable energy, nutrient recovery, water self-sufficiency, food production, monitoring and feedback, and I don't know why the thing just went off. <laughs> okay. Was that intentional? Did I go over my time or something? <laughs> anyway, um, okay, let's back up. So we had all of these different goals. It was a lot to take into account. And the entire time, we were thinking of these different systems principles. So where could we intervene, and how could we build communities that functioned in a new and different way? And the very exciting thing happened that after we finished this, it was initially a consulting project. So we created this whole conceptual blueprint with all this theory. And then um, a month later, we actually had to get going and build the project. So with very few resources, we were not a construction company at the time, uh, we had to get going and figure out how to retrofit 17 houseboats into these uh, new, unique, fully sustainable offices. And this shows a scene of um, one of the, the construction teams and us um, raising the roof of one of the buildings. So this down here, this was the first building that we got for one euro, a kind of nominal fee, and then we transformed it through the retrofitting process into uh, this uh, thing on top here, which looks a little bit like Noah's Ark. It, it was uh, quite an involved process altogether. We had to learn all kinds of different skills. Um, this is us with the community building um, the wastewater treatment systems that are fully decentralized based on um, uh, bas basically biofilters. Um, and one of the reasons for doing this was to transfer information so that people would understand how the wastewater treatment worked themselves so that they would not have the you know, desire to throw toxic chemicals or something down their drain because they knew that plants and different bacteria were cleaning the water for them. Um, and we built all these different monitoring and feedback systems so that we would actually close a lot of these different informational loops and get people to understand how this stuff was working. So uh, this is the test interface that we developed for the, for the site. Another really interesting thing uh, that we were looking at was how to deal with the polluted soil. So a special plan was developed to actually use plants that are native to the area to clean the soil and remove the different toxins from it. And so these are all different levels of resilience um, using sort of ecological strengths to process uh, problems on the site. 
um, and building new soil communities of uh, bacteria and, and plants that can actually handle these uh, issues. And this was the fateful day in uh, November, three years ago or so, when the boats were finally craned onto land, um, and uh, we didn't even know if they would hold together, if they would be, you know, if they would crack once we put them on the site, so it was quite an exciting moment. And the most amazing thing happened from this very sort of abstract concept of creating a community where resources are cycled and everything is uh, upcycled, the Curvul, the site in Amsterdam North, has now become this uh, central focal area of social activity, community development, and um, really uh, knowledge also on sustainable technology. But of course, the whole idea is not to do one-off projects like this, it's to really upscale how these things work. And for me, uh, when people ask, well, how does this lead to a consistent transition within the economy or within the way cities function and really build structural resilience, a lot of it is about the seeds that it has planted in scaling this up to all of Amsterdam. And, not, and from there, we have been scaling up these same types of principles to development in other countries around the world. So this is a picture from a study that we did for the uh, waste processing company at, in Amsterdam, which now mostly does incineration, to look at how the principles at the Curvel, the small site around cycling all resources and extracting nutrients, could really be scaled up to the level of a city. From that um, small project, we were asked by the city and several other key stakeholders, like the utilities, to develop a plan for the whole neighborhood surrounding this small plot. So this is um, another case of, uh, let's say, system principles that work, where if you create something that is replicable and the principles work, they start to grow on their own in a sort of natural way. Um, I'm not going to get into this whole case study of Bauxloterham, but this is the area where de Keuvel is also located, right here. And with this consortium of partners, we have developed this whole plan for um, taking those principles from that small site and scaling them up. And if you come to Amsterdam in the coming years, this is not a place where tourists go, but I would recommend that you guys take, uh, take a bike and head to, to the north and check out what's going, there, going on in that whole area. It still looks like a lot of industrial and post-industrial wasteland in some ways, but over the coming year, there are going to be a lot of new construction projects with fully circular economy principles, with a lot of resource cycling and um, completely new ways of developing that are popping up as a result of this project. So, <laughs> thank you. And I'm just going to fast forward to the last slide um, here, that if you actually want to get started with this in your own context, um, one of the best things to do is really to think about where do you have the most leverage within your system? So what do you have influence over? Who do you have uh, connections with? And can you find ways or the, these systemic patterns that are buried in your environment to uh, actually start to influence change? Because it starts small, but it can really expand. Um, this is our contact information. I hope you guys found this interesting. And I look forward to the Q&A, which I think is going to happen later, right? So. Thank you. Yeah, I invite you to stay right now to take a couple of questions. Um, yeah, Thanks. great. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> were you influenced by the? Backcasting model at all of Carl Henry Robert. You mentioned the word backcasting in your strategic process model, FSSR or anything like that. And, uh, and if, if, if yes, if no, maybe you should describe to people what it is because I've done, not done a good job of explaining what that is. Um, I didn't totally hear all parts of your question. You said, was, were we influenced by who? The, uh, the framework for strategic sustainable resilience. Um, no, no, the framework for st strategic sustainability. I heard that you said that. So, um, no, not directly, but, but the thing is, I'm sure there are lots of similarities that can be 
drawn um, with other approaches because it's quite logical, right? So if you are plotting a route with a car, you need to know where you are, you need to know where you're going, and you need to be able to draw a pathway. And that's the same with time and the way that we deal with our own environments and systems. Um, so I, I think there's quite a lot of parallels with any system that uses backcasting. Yes? Um, the first graph you showed is pretty amazing, where you mapped energy and resource flows for the whole world, which seems a little hard to believe, but I believe you did it. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you found the data, because that must have been a, a huge task. And then, are there any tools available so that more or less regular people or community groups or other consulting firms can do the same thing for their own bioregions? Yeah. Um, so. We found the data in over 300 different sources. It was a very challenging process. Um, we were basically going through uh, sources like the FAO, the World Bank. Um, there's a, there, a really interesting good source for that is actually um, materialflows.net, which is from the Wuppertal Institute. So they do um, a collection of a lot of different sources. But we were also really delving into what happened with all, that, uh, with all those different resource flows. Um, so there are lots of resources, but you do have to pull them together. That's the, the long story for, for that. Um, in terms of consultants and uh, community groups doing this on their own, uh, material flow analysis is one of the tools that we use a lot. We do regional analyses. We do prevent, uh, for whole provinces, et cetera. And we've developed some toolkits that um, people can Use. So we've, we've um, written up some guidebooks, basically. Unfortunately, one of the guidebooks, the, the main one that uh, describes how to do this is um, in Dutch, but there's going to be a new one, which is uh, from a European project called Screen, which is going to be published uh, open source shortly. They're all open source. So um, if you're interested, you can also uh, write us an email, and we can connect you. Cool. Anyone else? Or am I out of time? Uh, here, you? Okay. Right here. The question is, what would be the cities who want to close? The question is, it's off. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Uh, the question is, what, what would you advise to cities who want to incorporate? Um, the idea of closing information feedback loops to design better neighborhoods and, and change the way they make policy. How, how can cities begin to close these feedback loops to better understand what's going on and what to do about it? Okay, that's a, a complex question. Um, we work with a lot of different cities, and I think um, one of the most important things is that there needs to be a strong uh, and a clear vision uh, coming from the, uh, let's say, urban management, uh, from the mayor's office of a city about what, that, uh, what the objectives are, what that city should look like, where it's heading towards. And I think that that's lacking still in some, uh, quite a lot of cities around the world. Um, but then one of the biggest gaps um, in general is the lack of data, of consistent data in the correct format that is processable so that we can really understand what's going on, because we're operating in the blind most of the time. And um, I think that this is one of the biggest challenges that we face collectively. Uh, it's a call, actually, to anyone who's working in uh, city context to push for opening up this data um, and developing more common protocols and also not holding on to it in, in this kind of way. Because until you are actually able to verify what a policy does on the ground or um, you know, how, how people are responding to certain types of uh, new technologies, for example, then you don't really know what, you sh what your next steps should be. Um, so that's uh, one of the big things. And, and consulting is costly. Most cities cannot afford um, to have someone study a specific material flow for months. So. Um, we need to make this scalable, and automating that data collection is one of the key things. And that's also why I brought up informational feedback loops as one of these leverage points that we really have 
a lot of control over. We can do something about this. So, is that it? All right, this way? Okay.